So let's just get started. Um, let me give the mic <laughs> to Jesse. Uh, Jesse, let's do a quick introduction about, about yourself. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure being here tonight. My name is Jesse Owens, the second, no relation to the runner. Um, I'm a product, product owner at MasterCard, and the product that I oversee is a product called MasterPass. Um, and you can think of MasterPass as the digital acceptance of the MasterCard brand globally. Um, so uh, essentially what my role of responsibility is, is to ensure that we, we ensure we build products and solutions for our merchants as well as our issuing partners and creating seamless checkout experiences. Um, prior to MasterCard, um, I was at Imagine Easy Solutions, which is an education tech company um, which focuses around information literacy and, um, and, uh, and research. And so part of my role there was building out institutional tools for our, our schools and institutions, as well as building out the consumer-facing product. Some may know as EasyBiv was the online citation and bibliography tool. Um, and then prior to that, um, I spent some time as an engineer at JP Morgan um, building intern, uh, internal messaging products for our fixed income equities uh, desk for our New York, London, and Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong trading desk. Um, and part of my role there was building out um, API services that our internal uh, trading desk would then consume and, and interface in order to send trade assets out to the street. Um, and then um, just to round out my, my history, I was a comp sci major at Norfolk State University. Cool, and um, Jesse's also teaching the, the upcoming class of their product management course. And how many times have you taught before? I've taught uh, earlier this year, um, earlier in the spring. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Great. Hey, guys, I'm Joel Palathinkel. Um, just to tell you a little bit about my background, I started out as an engineer. Um, so I kind of had that technical knowledge. And after you know college, I, I went to my first job in Iowa. It was in the Midwest. It was a company called Rockwell Collins. And I worked as an engineer managing the radios that went on to F-18 fighter jets. Um, so I managed that. And my role was kind of uniquely different because it was half product, half engineering. And I just realized when I had some of that experience, I really knew that I was passionate about empathizing with the user and also um, working with sales and working with um, products that actually touch the client's hands. Um, so after that, I was fortunate to be able to move to New York and work at CBS. So I don't know if anybody remembers the show Survivor, um, but we built a product where you can text to vote people off the island. Um, so did that. Um, we did a really cool thing with Second Life. I don't know if anybody knows about Second Life. That was like around for like three months and then nobody heard about it. So um, did that for a little while and then you know that opened up some doors for me um, to continue working in media. So I worked at NBC um, and also Hearst Magazines. And while I was at NBC, I did some of their FinTech products. So I did CNBC, um, really understanding the user's journey on the financial side. And that opened up some doors um, to work at Factset. And now I'm the head of product um, on mobile and web technologies at, uh, at Factset. So. Awesome. So Joel has also taught, you taught that product school uh, multiple times. Yep. And uh, both will be teaching the upcoming classes. Uh, who's doing weekend and weeknight? Week Weekday. Weekdays and um, weekend. weekends. So. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, I have a few questions prepared uh, just to break the ice, but the idea here is to open the floor as soon as possible. And if you have any questions about product management, careers, or anything in between, feel free to fire. So, well, first question for you guys is, uh, how did you get your, how did you break into product management? Like, none of us had this, like, a traditional career path, so what inspired you, or who gave you that first opportunity? How did you make it happen? Yeah, I would say, uh, what inspired, oh, I, 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 okay. Uh, I would say what inspired uh, the transition in the product for me uh, was partly because of 2008 being at, uh, being at a financial institution and after having something so catastrophic happening, it just forced you to sort of reevaluate things, um, reevaluate what are some of the, your core values in terms of what you want to start building, um, what sort of industry you want to be in, um, and also looking at yourself personally, like what sort of skill sets do I need to, to be immune to any sort of, any sort of, any sort of um, impacts to the economy. So looking out to, looking to round out my skills. Um, and I felt like at the time I was fairly technical, um, but I, I, I knew in myself that I didn't quite have the business acumen or the, 
experience in design. Um, so what I started looking at is going online and figuring out, you know, what are some roles that can sort of intersect all those, all those disciplines um, into one role. And so came across product management um, as that role um, that can sort of satisfy all my different interests um, in product development. Um, but I knew I didn't have all the skills to make that transition um, at that point in time. So um, what I started doing is, um, may not recommend it for everyone, but um, I just built my own app. So I decided to solve a problem that I felt that me and my friends were facing. Um, just moving to New York, being new to the city, uh, one of the problems that I felt um, during the time was around 2009, 2010. Um, there wasn't really um, many social outlets um, for me and my friends. So I wanted to build something that can catalog all the events that are trending in the city. And so that it allows me to share my experience with my friends and, and my coworkers or anyone that I would want to hang out with. So built a tool that uh, sort of addresses that need. And I treated it as my product that I was looking to bring to market. So um, actually went to a couple pitch competitions, actually went to a couple meetups, uh, pitching my idea. Um, of course, there were some um, there were some limitations with that product, uh, given the acquisitions of Instagram, and you know that were addressing some, some similar needs around photo sharing, um, which ultimately led to a, a conversation that I had with a co-founder of Imagine These Solutions around the product that I was building, um, and so I was actually invited to the office, um, and I it was actually around the same time I was looking to make a transition, but you know just being constantly told no that, you know, told no about not only the product, but no, you can't be a product manager right now. It just kind of inspired me to keep working at the product and keep refining my design and development skills in the end so I can speak about the product, not only from a, from a business perspective, but also from a user experience as well as from a technical point of view. So um, leveraging those, those skills that I learned building my own app, I took it to the interview. So during the interview, I just demoed the app. And so, uh, the co-founder and the team was impressed enough to offer me a job to be a product manager, something I wasn't expecting because the, the meeting was just intended just to have a conversation about the app and just really just hanging out. Um, so it was a Friday and uh, it was a you know typical Friday afternoon at a startup and you know, everyone was just hanging out, just getting ready to wrap up for the weekend. And so that was, that was essentially my first break into uh, in the product with, uh, with that interview. And, you know, never looked back since. <laughs> Very cool. So what about, what about you, Joe? Yeah, so. I can hold it for oh, you. Oh, sure, thanks. So one thing I'll say about product management in relation to other industries and different roles is that you might see little hints of product management in a certain role, right? So in, you know, being a business analyst, you'll be doing a lot of, you know, requirements and documentation. That's part of product management. Um, but really educating myself on what the full picture is and building my network at work um, and learning what the product managers do, um, that really helped me to break in. Because when I started at Hearst, I was kind of a hybrid product project manager, but then they actually did have, um, six months later, they did have an opening in product management. So I built some relationships at work and I did some research on, on my own too as far as like what the, you know, what it takes. But, you know, having having those introductions internally really really helped me to, um, to make that transition. Um, one thing that I'll also add about building your own product, I think that's a huge thing. Um, I built a few apps on my own as well and that just really helped me to understand what product management is because you're just thinking like the user. Um, one thing I'll also say, which, uh, which is like my most exciting thing about the class is at the end of the class, um, everyone is going to be presenting a product that they built. So that's a great thing that you can bring with you as a portfolio when you do go to a company and say, hey, I used to be a business analyst, but I went to this class, um, this amazing program, product school, and like, hey, here's a product I built. And that way you can kind of do what Jesse did, where you can just show what you did instead of really talk about it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really good points. Uh, we've seen so many students who broke into product by building their own products and also people that maybe had a job in business analyst or project manager that were close to the product yeah. team, maybe they have the official title, and then after either the class or networking or something else, they were able to, to yeah. get help with that final push. But there are so many other paths, so happy to, to discuss with you. Um, now we'd like to open the floor for you and uh, let you ask any questions to, to Jesse or Joel. I have a list of 
question. Uh, just raise your hand and then I'll, I'll continue. I have a list of questions. Um, first of all, you come from an engineer background. Yeah. Do you miss coding? Do you miss like, you know, I mean, you, you both build your own applications, right? So, you know, as an engineer, you know, you're always having all these ideas and we're thinking about products all the time, but, you know, when you actually make that transition mm -hmm. from being you know, coding to managing, uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of hours that you're not coming up with ideas of coding or really challenging yourself as an engineer. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm going to rephrase the, the question just for the people online. Uh, pretty much the question sure. is, uh, as a product manager and former engineer, uh, do you miss coding? Yeah, so for me, I, I actually don't. I, I did engineering, I did coding when I was in college, and um, I kind of liked it when I was in college, but I always just felt myself being more inclined to working on the business side and working with customers, working with sales. Um, so that's just more natural to me. And when I was working at the aviation company, one thing that was really missing was the design. So that was what I was talking about, right? Like, so I did, I did engineering, but my role was like a systems engineer. So I did requirements development. I work with, you know, different teams. I work with, um, I work with marketing. I work with sales. I, but the one piece that was missing was design. And I knew that to be a product manager, you need to have all those pieces. So. Um, when you say design, you mean UX, you mean graphic design, you mean how you categorize? Yeah, so with app design, with mobile apps and websites, there's usually two categories. It's the UX, um, which is the user experience. So that's kind of your information architecture. It's a bunch of wireframes that really maps out every screen and how you interact. And then the UI is the user interface. Those are like the beautiful colors, the buttons. That's what makes it really look like an app. Um, so. A lot of times you'll see a full stack designer that can do everything, but then there's other times where, which I do now, is I only work with the interaction design people and they give me like these, it looks like a skeleton, but it clearly shows the navigation of the app. Um, and then only after you sign off on that, that's when you work with design, um, create visual design, as they also call it, which you know adds all the colors and layers. And I'm sure with MasterCard you guys do a lot of that stuff with your branding, right? Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. I guess from, from my perspective, I, I guess I would echo the same sentiments from Joel is that I don't miss the, the, the actual being behind the keys, um, but I, I, I am still very immersed in the actual development of the product. And so, um, and it really depends what type of product you're working on. Um, so for me, a lot of the work that I do revolves around building services for businesses. So going into the APIs, looking at the, the business logic of these services, and having to go into the API contracts, some of the business rule validations that we perform. So it's, and if it's consumer facing, you know, you're you're talking to you're talking about the user journey. So you're talking about how the users onboard to the product. What are some of the the key functions um, that we want to? What do we want to drive traffic towards? Which is more consumer facing, but it really depends on the role. But for me. Um, I'm still very much immersed in the, the technical details, but without having to be the one responsible of building out the, the service or the, the, the product that we're gonna deliver to clients. And they do have these roles that are called technical product managers. So those roles serve that great purpose too for people that do still miss the coding part and do still miss kind of the technology, but they're still also building business requirements. And I've had a few students in the past that were engineers and they were fortunate to transition into a role that's kind of still a hybrid. It's still a little more technical than a normal product manager, but they're not knee deep in the code, writing all the, you know, committing, committing code like every couple weeks, so. Great, yeah, it's, uh, now just to just add one last thing, it's just important that you distinguish the type of product roles you feel your skill sets best aligned to. So kind of what we talked about, if, if the product um, or the role that you're looking for really focuses around building services, quite naturally is gonna require you to be a bit more technical versus a product role that's more consumer facing. So be very mindful of those sort of roles that you're looking at because it's gonna require different skills in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I have a question for Jesse. Um, my name's Roy. Uh, um, so you talked about, you work at MasterCard, and you have this product called MasterCard Pass, right? And that's a, that's a, it's like a two-B two solution. So do you have to work with merchants and work in integration projects? Is that what you like? Right, yeah. right. So, so 
the, the, the question is uh, about Masterpass. Uh, do you get to work with different integration partners? Yeah, so we work with our integration partners via our commercialization. So we have um, how our organization split up. We have product managers who is responsible for going out to the market, um, that basically the markets that they own, and talk to merchants, talk to issuers, and come back with some of the feedback from those partners. And what, what my role is, we're, we're supposed to deliver solutions that addresses the need of either the merchants or, the, or, or our issuing partners. Oh, yeah. that, that's why. Yeah. So I'm wondering about for people who aren't technical and they're looking to get into product management, what are the biggest challenges you see? Okay, so the question is for people who are not technical, what are the biggest challenges that you see when it comes to breaking into product management? You take that one. Um, I think the challenges, the level of challenge also varies from what industry you're coming from, right? Like if you were a Broadway actor, that might be a little more difficult than someone that was a business analyst, right? So I think there's, a, there's kind of a, a spectrum of the variation, but I think with anything, sometimes when you're changing industries, you have to expect that you're probably not gonna get the same exact salary. You might have to take a little haircut because you're learning and you're taking a new junior role, but the great thing about product management and the tech ecosystem, especially in New York and San Francisco, is that if you, you know, get some experience and you work hard and you can prove yourself, you can move up and, and um, you know, build your experience really fast, so. Okay, so the, the, quest, the follow up question is, uh, what are the, the top skill sets that you need to build as a non-technical person trying to break into product management? Yeah, yeah I'll, just, uh, I'll just talk a bit about um, if you're a non-technical person breaking into product, um, I think what's important is that, one, that you understand that those are, those are some limitations that you have and you just have to leverage your team in order to get up to speed as far as some of the technical, um, the technical details in regards to the product. So having conversations with your engineers and either buy them lunch or get them a coffee or something that you can spend the hour or two, however much, however, however much, however much time you need in order to spend with those engineers in order to get up to speed from a technical perspective. Um, kind of what I've seen in the past is that sometimes if you don't have the technical acumen, it's hard for you to really challenge or hard for you to really trade off um, when, there's, when it's time to make tough decisions where if you have a launch a week from now and then you still have X amount of features to be completed before the launch and not understanding what are some of the trade-offs and what are the, the business impacts as a result. So um, I definitely see that, that being a challenge, but um, to answer the next question around core skill sets. Um, I think we've probably all seen it online. It's, I think it aligns with having a design sense, really being having the, uh, the, having the acumen of working with designers, and also from a tech perspective, being able to have a facilitated conversation with a room full of engineers and architects, um, and then also strategy, um, and, and also from a, a business acumen. So learning how the, how the features that you're building fits into the overall goal of the product and goals of the company. So that, those are all skill sets that are acquired over time, but once you start seeing some, some of those dynamics start to repeat itself, you'll start to recall some of the, the decisions that you made in the past that will help you to make even, even faster decisions in the moment. And I think that's where I feel like I, at least personally, I feel like I've developed over time is developing the, the quick decision making on the spot versus, well, give me some time to think about it and then I'll, I'll get back to you because sometimes you don't have that much time to making critical decisions, but um, being very immersed in those three disciplines is very important. I've got a few more skill sets that I could add. Oh, sure. Um, so I think one of the biggest sentiments with product management is really empathizing with the user. So as you build the product, really feel the pain of the user. So to do that, you really need to understand the customer's journey, right? So you need to, there's different ways that you can understand the customer's journey. You can look at some qualitative feedback. You can actually talk to customers and ask them, hey, 
what, what's your top three workflows? When you want to use an app, what's the most important thing to you? Are you a hedge fund manager? As a hedge fund manager, that persona, what do you need to do to do good in your job, right? So if you're building an app for them, you really need to understand the end-to-end -end workflow of that. Um, before you even do that, you need to determine if it's even worth doing that project, right? Like, why is your boss going to give you funding to be able to do this project, right? So there's a lot of due diligence that you have to do before that um, to determine if it's even worth it. What type of business impact is this project and you know this product that I'm building, this app, going to impact and how is that going to relate to revenue, right? So being able to be analytical and look at all that data up front to first decide if you're going to do it, that's important. I mentioned the user journey end to end. Then it's really the execution, right? So how do you, now you know that it's worth doing it, now you know what you need to build, how are you going to do it? That's really what Jesse was saying, right? Like first you need to design it, right? Like it's, what does it look like? How, how do you interact with it? Are you going to tap it? Are you going to pull down a refresh? All those things you need to hash out with design. Then you're going to work with engineering to turn it into something that's real and living. Um, and then how are you going to launch it, right? Like what, how do you, how do you, how do people know that you even launched that, right? So that's where you'd work with product management. You work with sales so that you can promote sales enablement, right? So sales can go out and sell the product and, you know, bring in revenue for the, for the um, company. So, you know, we'll, we'll drill into like a lot of the granular details in class, but really those skill sets of like just owning a product from the, the, maybe an idea or a concept to really seeing it into an app is like that whole journey that you're going through. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, yeah I'll just also, just quickly, I'll just add organization um, is gonna be extremely important when you, I know it sounds, sounds cliche, but you'll be amazed on how many different priorities gets thrown your way and having to organize it in, in a succinct manner to where you're still able to deliver, but able to maintain and re reestablish relationships that you have within the organization because a lot of your role is you're gonna be a relationship manager and sometimes you're not gonna be able to get everything done that you would like for your stakeholders and learning how to communicate to them when things aren't gonna be delivered when they, when they expect it. So um, yeah, just wanted to reiterate that. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. I feel like the role of product manager kind of differs depending on the size of the company, whether you're like a small tech startup or like a big media corporation, and depending on the industry, whether it's FinTech or uh, something else. You know, what would you say is kind of the difference in the experiences as a product manager, in the, whether the company is small or large, or depending on the industry? Okay, so the question is, what are the main differences as a product manager depending on the company size, but also depending on the company's industry? Yeah, so the biggest thing I would say is just the multiple hats that you have to wear, right? So if you're at a startup, you might be running growth too. You might be doing Twitter posts and promoting the company. Um, you might also be doing the design too. So I, I, I currently advise a couple startups now, and I get my wrist slapped sometimes because I just go ahead and do the design. Mm -hmm. The designer gets a little mad, but um, the startup, like somebody, you need like extra hands to do it. So you'll be finding yourself learning things very quickly. And the biggest difference with a startup and a big company is um, if you mess up, oops, like the company can go under. If it's a big company, oops, it's okay, you know, <laughs> just get it right like <laughs> next quarter, you know, and it's all right. You know, nobody cares, but that's, and also like big companies, if you wanna, if you wanna make a change to design, you have to go to the design department, make a request for design, and there's, there's a lot more layers of bureaucracy and, and uh, processes in place. It can be a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, so, um, but there's more stability at a bigger company usually. Um, smaller companies, it's, um, you're just kinda running around with your head chopped off and <laughs> hoping everything works out, so. Actually, I'd like to follow through that question. Uh, in light of like big and small companies and the, like the, the stakes between success and failure between mm -hmm. startups and large companies, when it comes to like breaking in for mm -hmm. those who are do, do not come from like the product, sure. Um, which one's easier? <laughs> so the, the the question is. Mm. I am afraid of even rephrasing this question. <laughs> let me <laughs> let me change it a little bit. Okay. Uh, what takes to break into product management in a smaller company, and also what takes to break into product management at a larger company? Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. 
I would say at, at a smaller company, they're looking for not just, they're, they're looking for skill, multi, a multitude of skills. Um, whereas in bigger companies, they're looking for specialization. So if you specialize in consumer or you specialize in marketing, then they hire for that role versus at a startup where you need someone who can wear many hats and do many things, you will want you probably would want to look for someone that can do a multitude of things or that can assist on different different aspects of the of the company because you don't necessarily have the budget to hire for each every single specialty. So it's probably it probably behooves the company to find someone that has multiple skill sets and not just someone who's just they're only they only know APIs. You know, they not only they know APIs but they also know how to build wireframes and they know how to build prototypes. You know, so those are those are things to be mindful of if you were to look for a product role at a startup versus at a larger company. And my answer would be definitely a startup. Um, I think also with the startup there's flexibility, there isn't as much formality. So if you're willing to even just join for free, just to kind of get the experience and kind of get your foot in the door and maybe offer to do it part time and then you prove yourself, you know, maybe when the startup raises the next round of funding, they'll say, hey, you know, you've already been with us for like six months and you already know our process. So it makes sense to just make you a product manager. Um, and I know somebody that was in operations at a startup, one of my students, and she was pretty much doing product stuff and she went to product school and they made her like the director of product which is awesome. Um, so I think there's a lot more flexibility and less like red tape if you want to just do something innovative and, and, um, and learn and just kind of wear multiple hats, as Jesse said. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the question is, what are some of the biggest mobile trends without the, within the fintech industry? I mean, I just think that the mobile usage in general is growing um, exponentially. As, as soon as we hit the iPhone 6 Plus, there was a massive jump in growth because that was kind of the, the intersection between the tablet and the phablet and then like a big phone. So a lot of the people that wanted tablets, they were really happy with the 6 Plus, and we just saw a surge of usage. So I think um, another big trend is tablet isn't really changing that much. Tablet is in parity with desktop and web, um, because the tablet, if you think about it, and we've done a lot of user experience research on this, users, users want what's similar on the desktop on tablet because there's more real estate, but it still needs to be optimized for tablet, right? So the buttons need to be big enough to tap um, opposed to a desktop where you're going to be clicking and hovering. Um, so those kind of like from a usability standpoint, um, those are some high level trends. And then I, I see it's still, I see phones still growing. And as you, you know, as you know, like, you know, Moore's law was kind of something that people were talking about a few years ago. It's not completely true now, like just, you know, the computing power doubling, but people, you know, the phones are going to continue to get more powerful and people are going to, you know, take the phones and hook it into a docking station that's actually going to turn into their computer. Um, and Microsoft's already done a few things like that already. Um, I think they call it a clamshell device where it's a dock drop in the phone and the phone is really your PC. So users in the fintech space and probably in any other enterprise space, their work never stops and they want to still be able to check and be up to date no matter where they go. So that's their user journey. Um, as your product manager, you really need to kind of understand that, that use case. Um, and like I said before, I'll really stress this, I mean, really empathize with the user, right? They're, they're on their train home from work, what are they going to be doing? They're probably going to be checking their phone, they may want to save some stuff offline to their tablet um, because they're a portfolio manager and they want to read stuff about the markets. Um, so just understanding those things, I think, is a lot of the due diligence you do, you'll do as you do the upfront analysis of the product. So, hope that was helpful. Yeah. So, what's the difference between building an internal application for a large organization versus shipping a product, a product that can be used by millions of people across the world? So, from a PM point of view, what's the difference? Okay, that's a great question. So, what's the difference uh, between building an internal product in a company uh, 
and uh, building an external product for thousands or, hun or hundreds of thousands of users? Yeah, I guess it just really depends on what's the problem that you're intending on solving. Sometimes um, it probably makes sense to build an internal tool versus building something off the shelf because it doesn't really support the level of customization that you need. And based on it, and, and so the, the thought process around that is the amount of time that you build, that you exude customizing this off the shelf product, you could have just built your own and it's really custom for the company. So um, think of something like content management. So think about if you're, you know, if you, um, you know, if you, if you build out content for your blog or your website, you want to you want to build your own internal CMS that handles all your assets and is able to you know and be performant as you would like, versus using something else that's off the shelf. So that's not something you actually want to ship to customers, but it's something that improves the operational efficiencies of your of your company versus something that you actually want consumers to use um, for intent of growing the business. So there's things operationally that you have to do along the way in order to as you as you start to scale. But then there's also things that you want to actually ship out for you, for customers to use. Yeah, and I've done both, right? So I've been, you know, at NBC and CBS, and those are consumer apps. So to really move the needle, you're looking at you know millions of users, um, especially if you're trying to make money off of ads. When you're on a when you're doing a B2B play, um, like a company like Bloomberg or Factset or um, Salesforce, you may not have millions and millions of users. You may have thousands of users. But those users spend, you know, 50 grand. You know, so it's one big sale. The sales cycle is a lot longer too, right? So to get somebody to use your application, there's a big process, um, especially in the financial space when you're working with institutional investors. Um, there's just that whole process there. So if you lose one of those clients, it's a big deal. If you lose one user from the, your pool of millions of users, just serve up a couple more ads and optimize your ads, and you may be able to make up for. Um, that segment. So I think the user acquisition is different. Um, you can also get different data, right? So you can get a lot of qualitative data and you can build relationships with your customers and get real-time feedback um, that's real tangible from the enterprise space. When you deal with a consumer app like NBC or if you work at Uber, you really just have the data. You know, I mean, you could probably do some UX research and invite some people to do some user research, which they do. Um, but it's a little, it's kind of secondary because you're kind of inviting them in and they're, you're not really working directly with someone to kind of touch the product. Um, so I think those are kind of the differences. And it depends on what your goal is for the product because the goals are going to be different too. So. Uh, what are some tips or pitfalls for when like you're interviewing a client uh, trying to find their problem? Okay, so question is, what are some of the tips or pitfalls that you have seen when you're trying to do some user research yes. with, with users of your product? Yeah, I would, I would say when, um, I, would, I would definitely say when you try to lead with features versus yeah. trying to understand their problem. Um, I think that's where you kind of get stuck, where you're, you, you're kind of left without a problem to truly solve versus you trying to force a, a feature on a potential client that, that wasn't even solving their problem. So I think is what, what Joel said earlier, is just really empathizing what that problem is and really understanding some of their behaviors and some of their challenges with either existing products that they're currently using and then using that as insights as far as based off of these suite of products that our clients use, here's our opportunity for this new product that we're going to yeah, I would definitely stay away from solutioning. So as Jesse said, right, like, I mean, you don't want to go in and meet the client and say, hey, um, are you saying you want a button that you tap on? And when you <laughs> tap on it, there's a green light that shows up. Um, so you're just kind of telling them what you want to do because you think it's a cool feature when you really should just be not even talking about any features. Just ask them to just completely do all the talking and tell them what they do, you know, in the morning till the end of day, what's their workflow? That's really important. Um, a lot of times, like our technology, when we've tried to do UX research, it worked great in all our dry runs, and then when we meet the client, it just doesn't, like the screen share for some reason doesn't work. So just making sure you dry run it and make sure like the technology, if you're gonna be recording users, um, just make sure you have like a good process in place to, to do it and like your operations of that 
um, are really smooth because that that's ruined a lot of our data. Just you know, not being able to access the logistics of it. So, yeah. What kinds of challenges do you enjoy solving, and uh, where do you see yourself in five years? Okay. So the question is, what type of challenges do you enjoy solving, and uh, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, it seems like you are uh, recruiting here. <laughs> <laughs> She's a life coach, actually. <laughs> right. um, I would say for me, just, just given my background, I really enjoy like some of the technical challenges, um, like just around infrastructure and like how, how, how are we going to support new consumer-facing features with our current back-end technologies, or what sort of, what sort of layers do we need to build in into our product in order to even to have our product more performant, or to, oh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really I intrigued on the, the architecture of the product behind the scenes, and so really looking at how different things are hooked together, and looking at how, how we can create opportunities for the product as we scale. So really, my, my interest goes into like, all right, it's cool that we, We've launched the product, we got you know a couple users using it, but what if we got 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 users? What is that technology on the back end? What does that look like? And what, what sort of technology is gonna be running behind the scenes? And you know, going from microservices to data centers, those are things that I'm really keen on. Um, but uh, it was just something that I've developed over time. But, um, but I also enjoy what the work that's put in on the back end, how it results on the front end as well. Yeah. And my, we'll talk about our, our five-year. We'll talk about our five-year goals. <laughs> no, sure. Um, yeah. So for me, it would be a little less on the infrastructure. I think I'm a little less passionate about that. But I've always been really passionate about design. So making sure the app um, just looks really clean and beautiful and easy to use. Um, a lot of times it's not right. Like you, you know, for a user to do something, again, right? The user journey it takes them like five taps when it really should just be one button, like if you think of Uber, right? You just tap one button and it really just tells you where the cab is. You don't have to go through like five hidden menus to try to request a car. And that would directly impact their sales, right? So I think for me, tying the design to scaling and growing users, I think is a huge thing. So I, I get really excited when I add, like I added this button on the home screen um, that helped the user achieve their workflow really quickly. And I saw that directly increase the usage. So I think just playing around and doing a lot of testing to see um, a lot of engagement in the app, that just kind of keeps me um, excited. Okay, and your five years. Five plan. years. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, within my career, I've seen my role just sometimes stay the same, but just get ex ex expand a little more. So, you know, if I stay at FactSet, it'll hopefully be that I'm just expanding and just taking on more products. So um, what I've seen is that people become product managers, and then later maybe they become a director of product, they have product managers report to them. But then later that gets larger to a macro level where you own the platform, and the platform has multiple products and it's a portfolio of products. Um, so I think just continuing to learn more um, and just expand my leadership I think would be a good thing to, to shoot for. Yeah, I would, uh, I would echo those same sentiments. Um, yeah, just continuing to grow in the role, continuing to teach, continuing to, to learn about my, my, my skill sets and working on skills that, I'm, that I feel that I'm weaker in. So just so I could just round out my, my inst institutional knowledge, not only of the product, but even of my own skill sets um, and just constantly being self-reflective of those opportunities, not only for me, but also for um, for products that I would want to manage in the future. As a software architect slash digital strategist, I've had a really good career for many years. I've actually worked for CBS News right now. Um, but it seems to be that as a product manager, you have to be an employee. There is not so many consultant opportunities. Why am I wrong about that? Oh, well, so the, the question is about product consultants, right? Like, uh, it seems like most of the product managers are employees, but uh, what about product consulting? Do you know any of those opportunities? Yeah, there's a group called the Talenter Group. They're in New York. Um, you know, I, I reached out to them when I was job hunting like a few years ago, and 
they're in New York. So there's a bunch of agencies that I think do hire um, contract work. So if that's something that you're looking for, um, that may be a good way to kind of get in as well. Like if it's kind of like an entry level contract product manager, you used to be a project manager, um, but you're able to kind of, you know, say how you can really um, fill in those um, gaps. That's something that is transitioned. So I think a lot of, there are some recruiters. I mean, it may not be as much as the full-time permanent. Um, and I think it also depends on the economy, right? The, the markets are doing pretty good now, so there's, there is a lot of full-time work. When the economy doesn't do as well, a lot of that does trans, a lot of that does change to contract work. So. Yeah, I think um, a company that comes to mind is huge, and they're based out in Brooklyn. It's an right. yeah. uh, agency, so the work in nature is, is agency work. So they'll work with different brands mm -hmm. on different problems that they have with their products. So you'll be tasked to solve those usability problems, the experience problems. So maybe you could still be an employee, but the work in itself is, it's your, you're a consultant. I'm and so you, that consultant, that's why I asked. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I also know a website called Geekster, uh, G-I-G-S-T-E-R. They also offer those type of services. Uh, it's kind of like a higher level version of Upwork or freelancer.net, yeah. where like, clients can hire um, a product manager who will be the point of contact between the client and the engineering team. So that's another interesting web to check out. How do you spell that again? Uh, G-I-G-S-T-E-R dot com. Okay, so the question is, as a business analyst who is trying to make a transition into product management uh, within six months, what are some of the tactical uh, steps that I can take now to, to try to increase my chances to get a job in product? Yeah, so I would say um, definitely what you can start doing now is subscribing to, so there, there's, some, there's some good resources online that you can start um, start consuming yourself with because as as a product manager, I think one of the I think one of the skills is that we didn't mention is being a constant learner. And so I think a part of that is reading a ton. Um, you know, I just find myself that's just part of my daily habits is waking up, reading articles, and then maybe during my lunch break read more articles just around either around the payment space or just just around just consumers. Um, and just looking at different how Experts have defined what is what does consumer research look like. So, so there's index at General Assembly is really good. Um, the black box of product management on Medium. Um, there's actually a great podcast called Exponent, um, ran by Ben Thompson, um, and there's a DesignBetter.co is another podcast I would highly recommend um, just to learn and just to really be immersed on how experts are viewing product development and just just really just absorbing a lot of information as you start to refine what your what your role is going to look like in the future so you so you mentioned that you're a, you're a BA um, a lot of what you do is an aspect of product management because you have to define very clear requirements for your engineering team to now go and execute and deliver so you can start framing your resume in a way that it it uh, it looks like you you've done product work because in essence you have so you can start doing that and start collecting feedback <coughs> around you know what what else needs to be packaged up to be even looked at as a product manager so um, you know I'll just say just reevaluating your reevaluating your resume and just how how do you want to and compare it to whatever resumes that resumes that you see um, online and just make sure that you're addressing some of the the, the key the key indicators that you are a PM or you have the skills to become one. Yeah, and I say, you know, you could know all of the knowledge about product management. You can know the whole workflow. Yeah. You can say all the buzzwords we're saying. 
Um, but at the end of the day, right, like if you don't have that in your resume, then it's just gonna fall to the bottom of the stack. So I mean, I think the two biggest things, I mean, there are people that get the job that didn't have all that knowledge, but they were able to jump in, go to a startup, and just learn it really quickly on the fly. Um, one of my favorite sayings by Richard Branson is, if you have a challenge and you don't know how to do it, just say yes and, and figure it out as you go. I mean, don't do anything too reckless, but I would say be, be hungry, you know, be open to you know, taking on new challenges and, and, um, and try to jump in and learn something. I think one thing that's made me successful is um, just being able to just handle change, like moving from aviation to media to finance. So, I think once you do get a job, for, if you're fortunate to do that, really just build um, strong relationships early on, like spend some time with the engineers. I mean, if you want to move internally, really spend some close time with your product managers and learn what they do um, on a day-to-day -day basis so that that way you can start um, maybe seeing if they can, you know, use some help and like maybe you can do a few projects with them and wear a hat, you know, maybe, you're, you know, maybe a big company is willing to do that. Um, I know a few of my students in the past that were kind of like a business research analytics person, but they were able to actually build some relationships with the product group and do a few projects. Um, but you know, I would I would definitely you know do all the studies, um, read the research. But at the end of the day, to get the job, the person that gets a job, maybe they don't know how to do the job that well, but they interviewed really well. Yeah. That's what really it's a sale at the end of the day, right? So. Can you convince somebody that you know how to do the job and that you'll do well? And do you know um, how it should be done? I think that's the end of the day, the strongest people that have the, re and it's, you'll see it when you start recruiting and applying. It's like, you'll see a slew of first round inter you know, calls with the HR um, group. If you're, get if you're getting those calls, that means that you have a strong resume, right? Because people are get you're getting people's attention. Um, but then if you have all these phone interviews and then for some reason you're just not getting the job, you know that something needs to be worked on with your, um, with your interview, right? So that's something that you need to work on. And I, I work closely with a lot of my students. Like that's the biggest thing that they have trouble with, um, I think, in my class, really just getting the job. So I like to try to have the students give me the job description and then I look at the resume and just make sure that the resume actually calls out you don't want to lie, you want to be honest about your experience, but you want to make sure that you're, you're highlighting your talents the best way possible. Like for BA, right, I mean, being able to write really good requirements, understanding the, the workflows, um, those are BA skill sets, but that's really important to product management. And there could be a company or a job um, that really, really focuses on that, and they don't do, do much design. Um, so I think really figuring out the right fit is another thing too, because you want to make sure you stick around for a while as well, so. I always say that trying to get a, a job, especially in a competitive space like New York product management, it's a job itself. So yeah. it's not about quitting your job and looking for a job, but allocating some time for that. Could be on weekends, could be after work, or before work, or during lunch, but you need to kind of block that time for yourself. And part of what we teach in, in product school is not just about how to do your job, which is actually the, the biggest part, but it's also how to get a job. Uh, because uh, to, to Joel's point, we've seen many good people that we know that could do an excellent job, but maybe they, they don't know how to sell themselves. And we've also seen the opposite case. <laughs> people that are really good at selling themselves, but maybe they, they can't deliver. So you have to find that right balance. And it's true that at some point, you will need to tweak your resume in a way that you can call the attention of a recruiter. You will also have to practice your interview so you can convince someone that you know how to do your job. But at the end of the day, you also need to be able to deliver, right? So it's a combination of both. Yeah. And I guess just to put it in a bow, um, I think storytelling is going to be extremely important. So maybe taking a storytelling class, um, there's Toastmate, uh, Toast, Toastmasters. Yeah. Toastmasters, yeah. yes. So I would invest into that um, and just being very confident um, telling your story. Um, and just figuring out what story works best for you, you know, all, you know, we're we're all we all have our you know personalities, and we all have our ways of delivering or telling the story to our <coughs> friends, family, loved ones. Figuring out what works best for you, and just putting it in the context of your career. 
and just really refine that into a point where you're ready to go out and sell yourself. Yeah. And I, I have probably around maybe four stories offhand, and that story is the end-to-end -end story of like how that product was built. And the reason why I have four to five is because the interviewer may just throw some random question out and like just having one canned story that you already talked about may not work. They may ask you, hey, tell me a difficult time um, as a, yep. as a pro that's a common one. Oh, yeah. Because they wanna know how you handle chaos and crisis, right? So um, tell me a time that you dealt with a difficult scenario in, in product management and how you handle it, right? So if I already kind of talked about the end to end for like one product, they can't really use that same product again. So it's good to just have a few different products you worked on, even if you didn't, you know, become the product manager, I'm sure as a BA, you know, there, there is some contribution to a product. So if you can highlight those parts of that, I think that could really help you out. So. Okay, so we have time for two more questions. So a basic question, then I have a follow-up. So can you contrast project management and, and product management? I'm, I work in a financial services firm, um, working with the user experience team, I'm a project manager there. Um, sounds similar, uh, but maybe there's the nuance that I, I might not be catching. Okay, so what is the difference between project management and product management? So, which is very similar, and kind of what we talked about BA, there's, there's a lot of similarities to, or there's, there's elements of project management to product, um, but I'll just say that project management is just around execution. Like you have, you have a project that starts and ends, we need to make sure we have, our, we have our list of tasks that needs to be done in a certain time frame or we miss our date. Those things are very similar in product management because if you have a campaign that's supposed to start this weekend, we have to make sure that we have the product done by tomorrow. Like we can't miss those deadlines. So you have to make sure that you're on task and making sure that people are held accountable that said they were gonna do certain things by a certain date. So I would say project is like ex is about execution and then product is more about um, you're looking at the, the product holistically and, and tying it to actual business value, not, not only to the company, but also to your users. And you know, being, taking a very iterative approach in how you approach it. And so it's, it's not just, it's, you know, you're not gonna just walk away from the product at, after this weekend. You know, there's, there's some learnings after, that, after the weekend, after the launch, you know, and you learn more about your consumers, so that will feed into the next iteration of, of the product. Yeah, the best analogy I would say is, you know, a project manager usually is the timekeeper, but sometimes they do, in the media space, I, I know the media space, sometimes you do have a little bit of a hybrid role where you do work with design, you have to come up with, you know, revisions to creative, and um, you might have some ideas and ideate, but then it's launched and then that's it. Um, product management, the closest alignment I'd say is being Steve Jobs, right? Because you have to think of where the product is going and one of his favorite quotes that I always think about is, um, you know, you have to think about where the product is gonna be five years from now. Like not, you know, think about the iPad um, when you only have like a CD player, you know? So today, right, like what do we have now um, and what's, where is it going like five? Because you may have to maintain that product and you may have to evolve that product and that may be your only baby that you manage for two to three years. Um, so how are you going to innovate on that? How are you going to get revenue? Because um, if you don't have revenue and the product isn't getting any value, a lot of times the product might have to get sunsetted. Um, but the project manager would be kind of, a lot of times we have a project management team. They kind of align with us and just make sure that we track all of our projects and how many projects we have and which ones are done and what's the status. Um, but that's kind of where it ends. However, there are some industries um, and there are different roles where you are a product manager, but just the company just titled you as a project manager or a, a BA slash project manager, but you're doing product management. So different companies have different titles um, for what you do. And it's sometimes it's aligned with like a certain code that they have for the role like in HR. Um, so just keep that in mind too. Okay, well, so the, the question is, uh, 
And, and that's a really good one. We, we, we call it sometimes this a superpower. So what's your superpower uh, when you join a company as a product manager? Yeah, I think being, having to work with a lot of high-end beauty brands, that's kind of out of fear. That's kind of forced me to be really critical of design. So when I worked at Hearst Magazines, um, some of my clients were like Christian Dior. So like if the logo was off by a pixel or if it was like a little stretched out, it was like a huge deal, you know, because the brand is such a big thing. So because of that, I've always been very critical and very, um, just very close to how the product should look. So I think as far as um, the design, I think I have a strong skill set. And I think the big thing with me is really, I, can, I think I can jump into different industries and different projects and try to pick things up really quickly. Um, and I think that um, is really helpful, especially if you want to change industries. Yeah, I would I would say that um, my superpower is that I'm bilingual and bilingual in the sense that I can jump into a design conversation and have a very not a productive conversation with designers about how the experience should flow and how it should work, but also I'm able to jump in a conversation with our lead engineers and architects on how should this be architected and how what are our data models going to look like in the future to support these new features. So. Um, I think I've been very comfortable in both spaces, um, and, and I think that's led to, to ultimately like me being successful and, and also being able to connect some of the two disciplines when they're, sometimes they may be at, at odds with each other, like the design doesn't work, work well with the architecture, architecture doesn't work well with the design, and so kind of being the, the middleman and help facilitating that conversation so that we can continue to move forward and everyone is, can, can operate in flow is uh, something that I, I truly hone in on. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joel and Jesse. This was great. Um,